Good evening, everyone. My name is Ann Savage, and I'm the president of the City School District of Albany Board of Education. On behalf of the board, I welcome you to our meeting. I'm joined tonight in person by uh, Board Clerk Tanya Bowie, Board Member Sana Manyawi, Board Member Dr. Chidar Chidar Chidar. I'm sorry, I'm tired tonight. Board Member uh, Vicki Wilson, Board Member Ellen Krejci, Vic, sorry, Vicki Smith. Tabitha Wilson is joining us virtually. I clearly have had a long day. Board member Ellen Krejci, of course, Superintendent Adams, Deputy Superintendent Roaring, and our counselor, Christopher Honeywell, are here. And I got most people's names right, so that's a good sign. In any case, this meeting is being live streamed, and the instructions to view the meeting are available at albanyschools.org forward slash BOE, where you can share them with anyone else who would like to join us. We will show the relevant slides and documents in the virtual meeting screen, as well as in the screens here in this room. You can also access them at that same albanyschools.org forward slash BOE if you want to control the slides yourself. You will also notice that some of us are wearing masks and some of us are not, as is the case in all of our school buildings. Masks are an, of a choice option. I chose not to wear my mask tonight, um, and we encourage everyone to do what makes them feel comfortable. Um, with that introduction, we invite those of you who choose to join us as we stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag. In addition to saying the Pledge of Allegiance, we always focus our meeting by restating the mission of the City School District of Albany, which is to educate, which is... I'm really having a long night, aren't I? Um, which, which is to work in partnership with our diverse community to engage every learner in a robust educational program designed to provide the knowledge and skills necessary for success. Superintendent Adams, do you have a report for us? I do. Good evening, Madam President and members of the board. Thank you very much. Um, we'd like to take just a moment because this has been a very difficult week within our school district, and we want to just extend our thoughts uh, to the family of our student that um, was killed in the car accident uh, from Hackett Middle School. Um, I do want to express gratitude to the faculty, staff, students, and administrators at Hackett. Um, the culture at the school is that of a family, and the reaching out to the family on behalf of the school and the district has been just um, phenomenal. Um, we have received, just so that the board is aware, we have received notes uh, directly to me from my colleagues around the capital region, just expressing their deepest sorrows and uh, condolences for the family. And um, I think it just goes to show how all of us really do make a difference in the lives of our children and that we are here to support each other. I would also like to thank our community members. There have been several community groups that have reached out uh, to see what they can do to support the family and support the school. As we know, our crisis response team was at the school to help with students and um, give students that opportunity to speak with someone, but also to be there for our faculty, staff, and administrators. And so um, just making sure that we keep that family in our thoughts and and making sure that we are here in order to support them as well as to support our school and so i wanted to just make sure that the board was updated on that information this is national library week and we are excited for the opportunity to recognize our school librarians who dedicate themselves to help our students find and use the books and resource materials they need to learn and grow School librarians throughout the school district of Albany create and maintain content rich learning environments that can transport our students anywhere in the world. Our libraries offer insight and information on any topic our students can imagine. Our librarians offer enthusiastic guidance, help students learn to explore books and other print materials, as well as the expansive world of digital resources and technology. Our librarians are an integral part of our district's commitment to ensuring equitable experiences and outcomes for all of our students and to engage every learner in a robust educational program designed to provide the knowledge and skills necessary for success. 
please join me in thanking our librarians for all that they do for our school community. Our Albany High Music Program will be well represented tomorrow night as the Albany Symphony Orchestra celebrates music director David Allen Miller's 30th season. I am looking forward to joining Albany High student musicians Nina Avalon Serra and Adeline Hubble in presenting a commemorative plaque to Mr. Miller, recognizing his leadership in our community. Along with his numerous musical achievements, Mr. Miller has been a tireless advocate for education and community engagement, connecting students to the concert hall and Albany Symphony musicians to our schools. The opportunity for two students uh, to serve as student ambassadors exemplifies that commitment. Ms. Nina Avalon Serra is a senior and the principal cellist in the Albany High's Advanced Orchestra under the direction of Tony Brennan. She has played music most of her life and plans to continue her music studies in college. Adeline Hubble is a junior at Albany High and is also in our Advanced Orchestra. Addie performs regularly with the Empire State Youth Orchestra and Siena's College Orchestra. She also plans to continue her music studies when she moves on to college in 2023. Also at tomorrow night's gala, our Albany High Albanettes and Troubadours will also perform under the direction of Brendan Hoffman. I am looking forward to hearing our students' performances on this very appropriate stage. I am grateful to the Albany Symphony for their partnership and their support of music in our schools. On Saturday, April 24th, the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention will sponsor an out of the darkness walk at the University at Albany. Our school district is partnering with the Albany Booster Club to support this important community event, which is organized to save lives and bring hope to those affected by suicide. Supporting the social, emotional, and mental health needs of our students is a priority for our district. Throughout our schools, we have student support teams and caring faculty and staff members who are committed to being there for our students. They build relationships that provide our students with that trusted adult that they can turn to when they are having a difficult time or are in crisis. We are proud to champion this awareness activity for our community. If you would like to donate to support the Albany Booster Club's participation in the Out of the Darkness Walk, please visit the upcoming events section at albanyboosterclub.org. Every donation will help bring the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention one step closer to its goal of reducing the nation's suicide rate by 20% over the next three years. If you would like to join the Albany Booster Club's team at the event, the walk will begin at noon on April 21st, I'm sorry, April 24th at UAlbany Dutch Turf. We appreciate the Albany Booster Club's leadership on this important topic and on behalf of our students, families and employees, we thank you for your support. I am pleased to announce that the Albany Public School Teachers Association recently received a grant to support a new initiative designed to diversify and build a more robust teacher pipeline in New York State. The Take a Look at Teaching initiative is a project of New York State United Teachers and the National, Association, National Education Association. ABSTA has selected Jennifer Justice, our district's mentor coordinator, to lead the Take a Look at Teaching work here in Albany. These efforts align with our district's equity initiative, and we are looking forward to partnering with ABSTA on this important work for our school district and community. Just as a reminder, um, this work has it started a few years ago and we were looking at how we could engage our middle school students in an after school club about looking at profession, you know, the profession of teaching and also eventually moving it forward to the high school. And so we're very happy that ABSTA has received this grant because all of the stipends will be paid for through the grant. So congratulations and we look forward to this partnership. A reminder that all of our schools and district offices will be closed next Friday, April 15th, to account for one of our unused snow slash emergency days from the school year. 
That could change if we need to use an emergency day between now and then, but please do plan ahead for the likelihood that school may be in session that day. We are watching the weather very closely, and so we just want to make sure that we stay abreast of that. All of our schools will be closed the following week, April 18th through 22nd for spring break. And this concludes the superintendent's report. I'll move forward with the district update. And as always, we start with our vision, mission and goals, um, looking at our guiding principles so that all of our decisions are grounded in creating those equitable opportunities for all of our students. Tonight, we have one topic and that will be COVID-19. We'll talk about cases, current protocols and vaccines and much of this information you have seen before. Um, so where are we now? We have 1,423 confirmed cases, 1,031 are students, 259 faculty, 133 staff. Uh, we are still at a 1.7 daily average for the first week of April. Uh, in March, we had a very low uh, 1.5 average daily rate. Our numbers are still headed in the right direction. They're going down. And so we want to make sure that we stay abreast of that. Um, as we look at our numbers and we look to move forward during the fourth reporting period, you're going to see some changes with regard to different spring programs and things like that, where some of the COVID protocols um, will be modified so that we can accommodate uh, parents coming to concerts and things like that. So you'll see some changes with regard to that moving forward uh, because our numbers are definitely headed in the right direction. And as a county, our numbers are headed in the right direction. The testing information, we will continue to provide that testing information. And then our current protocols, which are in place, uh, we will continue with our protocols that are in place. And at this time, oh, vaccine information, we have provided information with regard to vaccines. Um, as you know, um, watching the news, um, second boosters are available. And so you can reach out to your local pharmacist or pharmacies just to make sure what those um, timeframes are by which you can get them. I think at this time it's for ages 50 and above, and there are some other uh, stipulations with regard to getting the second booster. At this time, I'll open the floor for questions. Board colleagues, this is all familiar information, but is there any questions about this or any other um, district COVID issue? Seeing none, we will now move to um, Sorry, I just want to make sure I'm on the agenda. We have a relatively short agenda tonight, and given my inability to remember people's names, it seems like a good idea for me to check the agenda. Um, so that brings us now to public comment. We do not have any public comment tonight. We really appreciate it when people take time out of their busy schedules to share comments with us, either in writing or by voicemail or virtually or in person. All of those options are available to you, and the description of how to participate is available to you on the addressing the board page on the district website. So I encourage you to check there. So without any public comment, we now move on to routine consent. We also have a very short routine consent agenda. Um, so I, as you all know, all of the items on routine consent, in this case, there is only one. We all look at them very, very carefully, um, but we do re um, act on them as a group with no discussion in order to um, use our meeting time more efficiently. With that introduction, I now entertain a motion to adopt the routine consent agenda. Motion by Dr. Chatur, second by Board Member Smith. Are there any set-asides? Seeing none, all in favor of the routine consent agenda. That is unanimous. And that brings us now on to our discussion agenda. We do not anticipate taking any actions tonight. We could still take an action, but that's not the plan for this evening. The items that are just beyond discussion tonight will be acted on at a future meeting. So Superintendent Adams, back to you for the internal audit. Madam President, I would ask if we could um, move the budget update first, and then we can come back to the audit review. I'd like to entertain a motion to amend the agenda to reverse the items. Dr. Chator, second by Board Member Smith. All in favor? That is unanimous, and that is more than our five out of seven that we need to amend the agenda after a meeting has begun. So absolutely, that'd be wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much. At this time, I will turn it over to Deputy Superintendent Roaring to give a budget update. Uh, 
I will do the introduction. Um, our budget update tonight, uh, one of the things that we have to make sure of right now is we are still waiting on our state aid run, our final state aid run, and we do not have that yet. So I'd like to make sure that the board understands that we do not have many changes to our report tonight. In fact, the report is the same report that we have done for the past three weeks. We do have a few, one slide that has been updated and Ms. Roaring will address that. But just making sure that the board is aware, I'd like to go to the budget calendar so that we can look at those dates. Um, and at the end of the report, the board may want to consider um, changing some of our calendar dates because we do not have the state aid report. If we don't get it this week, then there needs to be some consideration with regard to upcoming meetings and making some changes. And um, I'll just put that out so that you can have that conversation. Um, but we, we are hoping that we would get that budget report this week and then that would give us time to make adjustments uh, with regard to staffing and, and balancing what we bring forward in order to make that final recommendation to the board and then take questions. And then if there are any adjustments, then we would need to do that as well. Uh, so I would call your attention to that particular piece that we may need to make some changes with regard to the calendar. And at this time, I will turn it over. Well, at the pleasure of the board, um, if you do not see a need for us to go slide by slide, because this is the same report that has been presented three meetings in a row, if you would like us to go through it, we can. If you do not, then we will simply address the slide that has a few changes. And so the pleasure of the board. The pleasure of the board is absolutely not to hear the same information for the third time, but it is to um, anyone who is listening at home, I do encourage you, all meetings are recorded in their entirety, and you can go back, I would recommend, probably to the March 17th meeting for the most complete um, uh, presentation of that. We also had a community forum where we presented the same material in addition to the board meeting. So there were multiple videos of this same presentation um, if you're coming into the process now, as I know people enter the process at all times. We also do expect um, to meet on this topic at least three more times before adopting the budget, barring a particularly late New York State budget, which might reduce the number of times we're able to meet. But if unless they adopt their budget very, very late, we do hope to meet three more times. Deputy Superintendent Roaring, whenever you would like to pick up. Thank you very much. Good evening, Board of Education. Our change this evening is on slide 15. This is our staffing ratio slide. Um, I want to call your attention to the column of actual staff by bargaining unit for the 21-22 fiscal year. Uh, this reflects the positions that were added as part of our Sarissa and ARP funds, in addition to the positions we planned in the general fund as part of restorations for 21-22. It takes our total to 1747.3, and then the projected as it sits right now would be 1764.5, which is roughly 17 uh, year over year that we've talked about in some of our pre previous presentations. The proposed column is subject to change. We are continuing to review staffing and may make some adjustments to that prior to presenting the proposed budget. Board colleagues, any questions? Um, the one thing I just want to verify is that certainly for the actual 2021-22, I know, I believe I know the answer to this question. I just want to verify it and maybe ask for a phrasing change on the slide. That if there's a vacancy, that number doesn't change, right? That's not the actual number of humans. It's the actual number of positions. It is the actual number of positions, yes. Okay. So so just in case there's confusion on that, it doesn't mean that there are um, 606 APSU members on payroll or FTEs on payroll right now. If there's vacancies, that number would not drop. It means we budgeted for that number of um, employees. Okay. Oh, Ms. Wilson. I'm okay. My question was similar to yours. And does anyone have other outstanding budget questions from anywhere else in the presentation? I know when we last looked, we're at about 1.6 gap, and I know that they are seeking to address that through hopefully some additional state aid, through some cautious um, attention to um, attrition and uh, the ability to not rehire for retirements as, as is appropriate. 
for a, get, as long as we can fulfill the needs of our students and those sorts of things. So we don't know what our real gap is going to be. This is the time of the year that's very difficult because we can't act until we know what our revenue is and we won't know what our revenue is until the state passes their budget. And right now that does not appear like it's coming right down the pike. Back in the bad old days, school boards had to guess. And hopefully we will not be in the bad old days, but if the state budget is very delinquent, we will just have to make our best guess about what we project our state aid to be, and then we will have to adjust accordingly when the state aid comes out. But hopefully it won't come to that. Anything else for Ms. Roy? Are we ready to go on to internal audit, or do we need to take a brief recess? We're ready? Okay, moving on to the internal audit. Good evening, Board of Education. If I could introduce Heather Lewis. She's here with us from Marvin and Company, and she will provide a brief presentation on our internal audit for the 21-22 year. Hello, thank you, everybody. Um, so as Kimberly said, we are going through the internal audit process. So this is the 21-22 internal audit, and this first slide lets you know why you need an internal audit. So there is this 2005 school financial accountability legislation that requires your internal audit in two different pieces. We have your annual financial risk assessment that has to be done, and then there's the required annual special area testing. Now, the um, draft reports had been reviewed in detail. Um, a few uh, months ago with the audit committee, we went through um, any questions and all the specifics of those reports. So those are available for your um, review. We're not going to go in um, in detail right now, but we'll go with more of a high level understanding. So we can go ahead and go to the next slide. So the first area is the risk assessment. So the way we design the risk assessment is we have various questions that we ask. Um, we interview different people in management, and then we perform walkthroughs of key controls. So we specifically look for documentation and ask specific questions that we have. Then we sample some transactions in some of those higher volume areas like cash disbursements, payroll, journal entries, extra classroom, that kind of thing, um, cash receipts. So we sample some transactions. And then the report itself is laid out into different phases. So the first section of the report identifies areas where we believe there are control weaknesses or potential risks that have been identified. Um, so those are, are listed as well as what that risk is, the specific compensating controls if there are any, and then any recommended changes to your procedures. The next section, we list out any areas that we looked through where we did not identify any control weaknesses or potential risks, because we think that's important for you to be aware of. Yes, we might have had areas that we recommended in these sections, but there are areas where we didn't come into um, identifying any recommended changes. And then we have the results of our sampling. So I said we look at certain transactional areas. So we report back to you on how those transaction area reviews went. And then there's a, another section that is the items removed from the prior year risk assessment. So that's always important to look at. You want to see what improvement has been made over the previous year. So we you know, always have lots of recommendations. Um, so it's always nice to see that there have been improvements. So this past year, there were six control weaknesses or potential risks that were removed. So six areas that had been identified in your 2021 risk assessment that were removed from 21-22 due to good procedures and things like that being put into place. And then the last section of the risk assessment is we provide an update on the prior year testing. So in 2021, you selected the employee benefit um, administration area. And we had some findings and recommendations. So of the 18 recommendations that we had for the 2021 area, we can see that six of them had been implemented and one was in the process. So there was a, a fair amount of recommendations in that area. So it's important to see the progress on that. So that was the progress on the risk assessment piece. The next area we have is your special area testing. So that's the second component of your internal audit that's required to be done annually. That area is selected um, by you guys. Um, it's not an area that, that we select. It's really designed for you to identify areas where we can be of best assistance for you. This year, the area that was selected was um, a really good area. Um, you had switched your software, your general ledger software, so your business office and human resources employees switched to a new software, WinCap. So we were tasked with evaluating the user rights um, to make sure that those were set up properly so that your controls and stuff are, are not only um, you know, designed outside of the system properly, but controls are restricted within the system. So what we did, we obtained a listing of permission settings. We compared those permission settings to any potential job descriptions that were out there or associated responsibilities by each employee. And then we have a report that details out by position 
and by module areas that we recommend changes or reviews be um, done. So any areas that we say we think this person may have, maybe has access to areas they shouldn't or maybe their access should be um, restricted or changed to read only. So that report has, um, like I said, it's by position, by module. There is even more detail that um, is behind that report, but it's more detailed than um, would be appropriate to include in a, a public report. Um, but that is always available, um, has been provided to management and it's available to the board um, if that is something that they would, would wish to see. So that was the special area testing. So those are areas that um, that area will be you know, looked at next year and we'll evaluate how the district progress um, in that area. That is the, the internal audit itself. So um, are there any questions, a very high level summary of, of what happened? Are there any questions that I can answer? Board colleagues, as always, especially with audits. Is that me? Hang on, I'm, so we're trying to resolve the, okay, I think we're good. Um, as always, especially with internal audits, we're very careful about what we um, ask in public. We did review the more detailed report submitted to management. And so I know the board is fully abreast of all the details, but we are very cautious about asking questions that might reveal additional risk um, for the district. But you certainly are free to ask any high level questions about process or um, internal auditing if there's anything you would like to ask. Any questions from my colleagues? This is going to go down in history. It's the fastest board meeting in the history of mankind. That brings us to the end of the um, discussion agenda. And I now know there's more. Oh. Superintendent? We need to circle back to a, a piece of the budget um, with regard to the playgrounds. Ah, uh, I wondered if we were going to do that tonight or if we were going to do it another time. Superintendent Roaring, Deputy Superintendent Roaring, did you want to talk to us about playgrounds? Yes, I would like to talk to you about playgrounds. So we introduced this topic to you all at the March 17th meeting when we provided our capital project update, looking at a new playground for AIC dual language over near um, the Edmund O'Neill building. There was a very thorough process undertaken. Um, as a reminder, the board made the decision last year to relocate dual language and reestablish AIC at the Edmund O'Neill facility. It is a pre-K-12 program and there is not a playground in that immediate vicinity. As part of that, we made an application with the Albany, Count Albany Land Bank to purchase two parcels um, in proximity across the street from this to look at a new playground. SED does require district voters to approve the use of taxpayer funds to construct or install a playground. And the playground construction may be funded through the district's operating budget or use of capital reserve funds. At this time, we would anticipate any playground scope being part of the district's operating budget proposal for next year and offset appropriately. The proposal was brought forward by the playground task force, which met four times with Principal Stead to review the elements that they thought would be important to include in this playground to make sure that it was accessible to the ages in the school. Looking at the first, this is an overview of the aerial. So you'll see the Edmonio facility, and then in the top left-hand corner, you'll see the arrow pointing to the parcels at 41 and 43 North Lark Street that we are looking to purchase with voter approval. And then the other two areas point to uh, the road that runs behind the building, and then another small parcel that is adjacent to that. We are also looking to purchase from the land bank should the voters approve that. This diagram reflects what would be proposed to be constructed in the 4143 North Lark Street parcels. We can merge those parcels into one and it would include fencing around that area to make sure that it is secure, um, but it also includes these proposed play components, including the shade screen table and bench. And please note that these parcels are slightly different depths, so the proposal does account for that. You'll see one side goes a little bit further back in terms of the brown play coverage. We've looked at a couple of potential different contractors for this, accessing pricing through cooperative purchasing, and the proposal would range in cost between about $246,000 to just about $300,000. These are rough estimate numbers. These are not bid numbers or final numbers. So we would be looking at an amount not to exceed $300,000. A second proposal was also made for the area behind the school. 
which would include modifications to the asphalt road and uh, use of that parcel that's adjacent to we're looking to acquire. Here they're looking to do a turf field, a small play area with a climbing wall, and then maintain some, some asphalt for hardscape play. This proposal had a slightly different cost range, and it ranged from about four, 383000 to about $400,000. So this would be in addition to um, taking the total to somewhere between six fifty dollars and a little over $700,000 if both parcels or proposals were done at the same time. Looking at our next steps, the voters must approve the purchase of the parcels at 41 and 43 North Lark. That is a proposition that will be on the May 17th ballot. They would also need to approve the funding for the playground construction, which we would be proposing as part of our operating budget for 22-23. The play area behind the building, at this time, the district does not currently own this land. Um, so there are some questions as to whether or not the land can be acquired from the city and what the timeline for that would be. We are actively proceeding and proposing to the voters approval to purchase that adjacent lot to the road behind the building for school use. Are there any questions? Any questions? So I think the this the net summary, just to to make sure that I've got it clear in my head, is the budget that we anticipate presenting to the voters, barring some sort of very unexpected thing to happen with the state aid when the budget passes, would include the first pro playground that you described um, as part of the operating budget, offset by the use of reserve funds, so that it wouldn't increase the tax um, impact this. Uh, year. Is that is that right? That would be one path forward, yes. We would be accessing appropriated fund balance. Thank you. I used the wrong term. I appreciate the gentle correction. Dr. Schur. The playground is also reimbursable, right? By CD. So it's like 300,000 plus 700,000 that we're talking about. We will, it's partly reimbursable, right? Because it's educational. So we are having very close conversations with SED right now to determine whether or not this would be an aidable project. Um, and we have not received their final verdict at this time. And I think we're also talking to the city about making sure that we have good traffic control and safety yes. issues to get our kids back and forth across the street. So no update on that at this point. We have not received a firm response from them, and that is one of the elements that SED is also looking for. Okay. All right, anything else on budget? Yes. Hello? Board Member Wilson, go ahead. Can we bring up the slide with the budget, the details? Are you looking for the budget for the playground or the whole budget? No, the playground, sorry, the number okay. slide. Yeah, for the, for the portion that we're planning for next year, so the one that shows roughly yeah. $250,000. This is the one that we anticipate we that we could possibly have additional parties help us with. Is this the same because it's across the street and part more part part and parcel to the neighborhood? So this is something that we can consider. We're waiting for um, feedback from SED on aidability because that would be our first path forward. If that were not an option, then we would be looking at potential other partners. I ask because I know there is a um, initiative right now for communities that are environmental justice communities are impacted offset and I know they're they're doing studies and things of that nature. So I just wonder if there's any alignment there with maybe the neighborhood associations that we can look into this because yes, there are there is a park nearby, but I don't know what the status you know is is further. So this would be a park that's closer to the larger you know community. And although fenced in, I'm I'm happy to hear about it, the fencing because I'm just concerned about you know students, children having balls and them going potentially in the street and things. So the fencing would it be designed in a way that it's not precluding people from the community using it. It would just be like more so for safety, right? At this time, the proposed would conceive of a full fence that would have access gates that would allow for um, both person access and vehicle access as we need to refresh um, playground material and things like that. But it would be fully enclosed. So I think the question that Board Member Wilson is alluding to, which is a question I think we really do need to to tackle and to have a, a good, solid conversation with the city, 
is whether this is a playground that would be available to the general public, which I know we all in our heart want because there is nothing harder than the idea of a child walking by a playground that they cannot walk, play in. That is a truly bothersome um, idea. On the other hand, I know we have had many, many challenges with our um, city-owned playgrounds and the maintenance thereof to make sure that they are in, in appropriate shape for our students to use them every single day for recess. So that is, I know the superintendent um, has had conversations with the city and will continue to talk about whether there's a way that we could make this a, a, a playground that's of use for everyone. Um, so I, I would like to hold that this is not a decision that's been made yet um, and that we will look to work with our partners in the city to um, figure out a way um, to ensure that, that children can use the playground. Um, and this has been a problem for us in every neighborhood. This is not unique to this playground. We have this concern at New Scotland where often the playground is locked. We have had this problem at the Delaware Community School. Um, and uh, well, Ash is the other problem. Uh, Ash, we've had the problem with the public playground that is not maintained properly. Toast, we've had that problem. But for, for district-owned playgrounds um, under lock and key, we've also faced that at New Scotland and Dual. So it's it's this constant push and pull of who's how are we going to do the maintenance? How are we going to make sure that the playground is is in a position to be used. So I really appreciate your bringing this up, um, Board Member Wilson, because it's something that I think we're all really struggling with how to do and make sure that we can do the very best we can. So I look forward to hearing about more conversations with the city about how this this could be done. Board Member Alvinyawi. Can we move to the, uh, the next um, uh, slide? that design slide for the behind the school playground. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I was just kind of curious, uh, what is the time frame that we're looking at for this? And is there like, is there a reason that we would want to have two, like, like is it because we would have two classes using two different playgrounds or is this like a playground for like first graders or something? So I think there's two answers. I, I, I'll tell you what I know, and then Deputy Superintendent Warren, you can correct me. Um, yes, the, the potential would be there for there to be children of different ages. Um, this this space is currently used for soccer right now. Um, it's an asphalt strip, and they block the street, and they use it all the time. Um, so it doesn't have any playground equipment, as, as shown in the diagram, but the space is used for recreation, and that would not go away. That would not change. Um, However, there is a um, legal question about ownership that Mr. Honeywell is actively working on addressing. So even if we wanted to do this full, put, full um, approach, we couldn't do it um, in the next few months because we're still working through the legal site control issues. Um, so, so I think where I think where we are is yes, the the site will still be used for recreation. Nothing will change about that. But whether or not we can do these amenities will depend in part on whether we can get, get full control of the site. I see. Does this close off the street in the back? This would be, I believe, the entire width of the street. Is that right? Yes. So you see the um, the piece at the top that maintains the asphalt. That's essentially the width of that now. And then as you move down, that shows the blending of the parcel adjacent to that we're looking to perturb. So you'll see at one end that road would become a turf field. And then it would maintain asphalt going out the other side for the hardscape play. Yeah, I think we, one of the things we should keep talking about is um, the use of turf for elementary school playgrounds. Is it's really an interesting thing because we did it at Delaware, um, and my understanding is that it's it's good in many ways, but it's also challenging because it's hard to play soccer in the snow, and the snow doesn't melt on the turf the way it does on the asphalt, and you can't plow it. So there's there's good and bad um, in having in having turf um, in various places. So it's just something we should keep keep our, our eyes on what, how that is being successful and not as we decide what to do there. Ms. Smith. I just wanted to uh, piggyback. Uh, so Mr. Almanyawi, I think also maybe what you were asking is whether that would be completely closed, like fencing around that would, um, you know, protect. Well, it's it's another safety issue. So. Um, at both ends so that the balls and toys and children aren't running everywhere. Was that part of your question? I, overall, I have design uh, questions about this. I'm not entirely sure, like, uh, orientation-wise. Like, I, I understand we're looking at the end of the street now, so we're going to hypothetically uh, request that the city allows us to 
cut it off. So it's what you're actually looking at in this. I don't know. If, does it show if you go back two slides to, to Ms. Bowie to the aerial? It may or may not show there. Keep going there. If you look at this slide to the right of the white roof, you'll see that there's a little piece of asphalt that's wider, closer to the um, this closer to the bottom of the picture. Do you see what I'm talking about? That's a little tiny lot that we are purchasing, hopefully, if the voters approve it. So that's it's wider there. Um, and that's why in the diagram, it looks wider in the um, front of the diagram and narrower in the back is because we would, assuming the voters approve it, own a wider space um, in terms of cutting off the street the flow of traffic. Right now they are doing that during the day. They are closing off that to traffic during the day, every single day. So kids can play there every single day. Um, yes, right. And um, and that will continue. That is not anticipated to change. Um, but the question of whether it could be permanently closed off is related to the ownership and the site control. And that's where we're back to the lawyers. And I like lawyers. They're helpful. Anything else on that? I, I agree about the proportions of that diagram. It's hard to understand what's happening. Um, and I think, you know, if if we look to do this next year, we'll have to get a, a much more clear diagram, I think. Miss Yes, yeah, sorry, Andor, if you if you go you can go over and take a look as well. And you can I just don't know if you spent much time at that building. I was there uh, on my way to the AFE. Okay. Uh, yeah, I passed through. Yeah. Actually. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. I will look closer though at that it's a bit of an access road yeah yeah right i always thought it was an actual street it's not an actual street yeah Park. one important distinction there it's not a public street right it's actually land that's owned by the city and they put a driveway i think might be the better term mm -hmm. it happens to connect two city streets it's utilized by the district for parent or school bus drop off i forget which one's in the front which one's in the back but it, it's it's essentially a private road that's owned by the city because they happen to own that land. Yeah. Much better clarification. Thank you. All righty. Anything else on this? Otherwise, the next time we go through the budget presentation, we will see the cost for the, f the first half embedded in the presentation slide. So it will make our budget look slightly higher on the revenue side, and, I mean, on the expense side, and then on the revenue side as we use appropriated fund balance to offset the expense. And then if, in fact, this turns out to be aidable, which we hope and believe it ought to be, um, then it will come back to us through increased building aid over the last next 15 years um, as we get that reimbursed to us. As Deputy Burry explained to me yesterday, and I am now explaining to you. Um, anything else? Any committee reports? Well, I see this meeting tomorrow. Policies meeting tomorrow. We normally meet tonight, but we flip flopped for the uh, gala. Okay. So, so uh, yes. So uh, facilities meets uh, next Tuesday, the twelfth, and uh, we will continue to be virtual at that point. So uh, look for the notice. Thank you. Anything else? Any other business for the good of the order? I would like to entertain a motion to adjourn at 7.14 p.m. Motion by Ms. Smith, second by Board Member El Mignali. All in favor? That is unanimous times six. Thank you very much.